What's going on, everybody? Luke Tatum here. Today, I want to do a bit of a reaction to a reaction. The Graham Stephan show. Graham Stephan, he did a reaction to some Dave Ramsey show segments talking to some callers. And the back half of this video that I'm referencing today is focused on the infinite banking concept. Uh, you might see some things around the room here that would lead you to believe that I know something about that topic. Not saying I'm the definitive expert in the world. I'm an authorized infinite banking practitioner. And one of the things that we like to focus on as practitioners, there's not that many of us, by the way, is finding the wrong things that people are saying out there. There's a lot of just information is just misinformed. I'm not throwing anyone under the bus. Graham Stephan has some good content, but infinite banking, it's you got to kind of follow the rules with this. So I want to talk a little bit about the video his response, and also the comments underneath the video. First place we want to start here today is around 5 minutes, 43 seconds. I'll link to this, of course, in the description. This is where he shifts focus from the first call to the second call, which is the, uh, the part where he's talking about infinite banking. And so from there forward is really where we're going to focus. Let's see what's going on here. Now, if you thought that concept was bad, there's another one that's even more confusing to me, and it's infinite banking. It's these people that say you can make all this money from doing infinite banking and using the system to your advantage to create money out of thin air. And I never understood. I, I, I tried so hard to understand what infinite banking is. And if you're as lost as I am, just watch this. Here's a debate with Dave Ramsey on it. Okay, so even before we get to the clips of the Dave Ramsey show, we have Graham just talking about uh, how infinite banking is this make money out of thin air kind of idea, and that's just simply not true, right? The idea of infinite banking in the simplest possible terms is the idea of recapturing the interest that you are paying probably right now to outside lenders, outside entities. Could be a finance company for your car, could be a bank for your home renovation loans, could be all kinds of things, right? But the idea that you are paying interest, you're getting something that you cannot or did not pay cash for, and you're paying interest, you're paying interest to somebody. So what if that somebody was you or an entity that you own and control? In this case, the infant banking kind of applied Generally, we're going to be talking about a dividend-paying, mutually-owned whole life insurance company or whole life insurance policy, specifically. The reason it matters that it's a mutual company is because with a mutual company, if you own a policy, you also are a part owner of the company. So if you've got to pay interest, would you rather pay it to Bank of America, who's going to divide up the profits that they make in interest? among their shareholders, which you're not one of them, or would you rather it pay it to an entity you know, where you are a shareholder, right? It's a mutually owned company. The only people who own the company are people who have policies with the company. That's, that's all we're talking about here is recapturing interest and bringing it into a, a place, an environment that you control. Okay, let's move on. I am calling in response to a video I saw recently that you claimed infinite banking concept was a scam. I um, do not agree with that in certain points that you made in that um, video. This is the most polite debate that I've ever seen, where someone comes on and be like, I disagree with you with what you said, and that hurt my feelings. And I'm going to share my thoughts and, and tell you why I think that you're incorrect and misinformed. It's like, most people just lay on him. They like, well, hey, Dave Ramsey, you're an idiot, you're this, you're that. No, this seems to be pretty respectful. There's a few points that I wanted to discuss that um, I just didn't agree with. Okay. Um, do you want to just kind of take one thing at a time? Sure, and... no, that's fine. Sure. Okay. One of the main things was that uh, you claim that uh, the cash value dies with you. So here, we haven't quite gotten to Dave's reaction yet, but the idea that he'll he'll jump on and kind of reinforce as we get into this is that the the death benefit, or excuse me, the cash value in a life insurance policy dies with you. Okay. What is the cash value? The cash value is the present value 
of a death benefit that the insurance company must pay when the insured person either passes away or for modern life insurance policies, reaches the age of 121. Uh, it's more likely in most cases that they will pass away before that time, at which point, whatever death benefit is in the policy, and there's different structures, and you can use these policies in different ways, but at some point, there's a death benefit payment or the policy is surrendered. If the policy is surrendered, the cash value, all that is, is the insurance company saying, okay, if you take us, the insurance company, off the hook to pay this death benefit, we'll give you the present value of the death benefit. So then you get the money. Or if you actually keep the policy long term, which is something I would encourage, then okay, your beneficiaries receive the death benefit. Okay, so it, the money is not gone. They don't just keep the cash value, right? It's it's not it's not. Oh well, you died. <laughs> we did. We couldn't have possibly seen that coming. I guess we'll just pocket this. It, there's nothing nefarious going on here. I mean, think about a term life insurance policy. Say you buy a 10-year term. Well, it's probably inexpensive, so you have this 10-year term policy. Then pass away. Okay, death benefit is paid, but you probably won't. Which means they take 10 years of premiums and they put it in their pocket. <laughs> That's what it is. The premiums are cheap because the chance of them actually needing to pay the death benefit are very small. That's all. So if you want to think of whole life insurance as a 50, 60, 70, 80 year long term policy, well, that's not a completely incorrect way of thinking about it. But of course, the premiums are higher because they have to pay. <laughs> so, all right. Anyway, let's move on. Now, for those unaware, because it's really difficult to explain, uh, infinite banking, and, and I'm quoting this from NerdWallet, okay, but it involves getting an insurance policy and then using that as a line of credit. As NerdWallet says, whole life policies earn cash value at a guaranteed rate over time. Once you've accumulated enough, you could begin to borrow against your life insurance policy. And again, that's how it's kind of creating this infinite money glitch, which to, to me, it just, it never fully makes any sense, as you're about to see. The actual cash value dies with you no because well, yes you it can does think, well, okay but but your your death benefit is larger than your cash value so it so whoever you're so for me i looked at it because you bought generation. more insurance so now we have graham kind of referencing nerd wallet and talking about you accumulate cash value inside the policy and then at a certain point once you have enough you can access the cash value and you, you can borrow against it. Great. So you can borrow against the cash value in a whole life policy. Every company is going to have their own particulars when it comes to what specific contract, what the rules are for accessing that money. We work with companies that give you basically immediate access to cash value, and there's not a a threshold that you must hit before you can access it. So that's that's something that personally I don't have experience with as far as like a minimum amount, although that, that may be a thing with some companies. Now, NerdWallet, of course, their article is specifically talking about just a plain old whole life insurance policy. When you're talking to an infinite banking practitioner, what you're probably going to be dealing with is some sort of heavily customized life insurance policy. What does that mean? It means that we're adding some riders, some optional riders, some additional structure, some additional options to the policy to give it more features that make it valuable in the present. If you go buy from your local insurance agent that would sell you like, say, a homeowner's policy or a car insurance policy, if you go talk to them and say, hey, I'd like a life insurance policy, can you make sure it's whole life? They'll sell you one, but it's a simple whole life policy. It's going to accumulate cash value extraordinarily slowly. So that may be kind of where this idea of, oh, you have to wait a while to use it is coming from. Some policies with some companies don't have cash value at all by default in the first year. Some don't even have cash value at all in the first couple of years. Now, it depends. <laughs> the cash value really is there because it's just the present value of the future death benefit. 
However, whether or not you can access it is going to depend on the nature of the contract. And of course, you should look at this kind of thing before you sign a contract with a life insurance company. Here you have Dave next drilling down on this whole idea that the cash value dies with you. Does it though? All right, let's go on. If you're still confused, this user on Reddit actually put this into really good words in a way that I wouldn't be able to clarify as well as this. You lock in the interest rate you have to pay on the loan at the beginning and then hope the investment earns more. You're taking all the risk and the person who loans you the money gets all the safety. All of this is bundled up as a vehicle to sell you whole life insurance, which honestly speaking sucks. If you want to borrow against investments, you should use investments that earn good returns so you have a good shot at having a higher return than your loan interest. Okay, so here... Graham is jumping to Reddit to talk about how IBC works, which fine, here we are. We've got this Reddit post. It says, the part that he highlights, you lock in the interest rate you have to pay on the loan at the beginning and then hope the investment earns more. What they're talking about is you hope that the whole life insurance policy itself makes more money than the cost of the loan interest. Well, is the interest rate locked in? Well, it depends. There's variable and non-variable loans out there. Is your investment, which whole life insurance is not an investment, it's a savings tool, but if, you're, if your policy is earning dividends, which is what the mechanism is here, if it's earning dividends and they're enough to cover your loan interest, then that's free right? From a certain point of view, I don't like thinking of it that way, but it's okay. If it offsets your interest cost, that's pretty cool. It's not free. There is an interest cost on the loan, but it's pretty cool. If it's higher, great. You're making money even while you're accessing the cash value to do other things. What are you using the cash value for? It doesn't matter. You could be buying investments. The kind of comparison that we're trying to force here is oh, I could go buy mutual funds and then I'm just going to make all this money. But the thing with mutual funds is that if you take money out of the mutual fund to go buy something else, say you want to buy a business, let's say it's a laundromat. Okay, you want to take money out of the stock market and then go buy a laundromat. Great. I'm not even going to talk about taxes and capital gains, all these other things. Let's just say you get the money out and you go put it to work buying the laundromat. Is the laundromat a good investment? Awesome. Great. Yes. You aren't earning money with the mutual funds, right? You took the money out. You're now, hopefully, after a few years, because that's how businesses tend to operate, you're making money on your laundromat purchase. Cool. But you don't get both. Whole life insurance, when you're using a what's called a non-direct recognition loan, you are earning the dividend from the insurance company for having the insurance policy. And if you use that to buy a laundromat, you're earning whatever money the laundromat earns you. You get both. You're not actually sacrificing anything whenever you go and, and buy the business investment. Yes, there's an interest cost, but are you buying a good investment or aren't you? Interest rates for the recent past have been around 5% on these policy loans for most companies. And so, okay, can you earn 5% with your investment that you bought? Okay, I mean, we can get into the structure of the policy loans and all those things in a lot more detail, but but the question is not, again, it's not, would you rather earn money in the stock market? Or would you rather earn money in life insurance? The question is, would you like to earn money in the life insurance and something else or just one or the other? It's just not, it's not a fair characterization. And then to finish out this Reddit post, all of this is bundled up as a vehicle to sell you whole life insurance, which honestly speaking, sucks. If you want to borrow against investments, you should use investments that earn good return so you have a good shot at having a higher return than your loan interest. I have to respond to this because that is, uh, and I, I blame Dave Ramsey for this, even though I love Dave Ramsey. Uh, the idea that the only people who have anything positive to say about whole life insurance are people who sell it. I sell whole life insurance, okay? I have a team that sells whole life insurance. However, I was a user of whole life insurance. I was accessing the cash value in the policy using policy loans first. I was already doing this. And then I became so infatuated with the idea. I love it so much that I became an agent and made this career out of it. It didn't happen the other way around. It's not that I only talk about it because I get to sell it. 
I was passing out copies of Nelson Nash's Becoming Your Own Banker when I was in a retail store, okay? I, I wasn't making any money doing that. I was losing money giving copies of the book away. But I, it really, really inspired me and it made a huge difference in my life. That's why. It's not because I wanted to sell it. Anyway, let's move on. So all of the centers around you purchasing whole life insurance, that paying you out, you reinvesting that and then borrowing against it, which to me, there's no such thing as free money. It's like going to a casino and saying, oh, I have a winning strategy. I could go and beat the casino every single time. No, you can't. If that happens, the casinos will eventually put an end to it. They'll stop it. You're not going in there anymore. They're going to patch it. and It's going to be done. So I, I think when it comes to money, same thing's going to apply. Graham here talking about his casino metaphor. Uh, really not really a good metaphor to use in the case of a life insurance company. Again, you are an owner of the insurance company. If you own a, a whole life policy with a mutually owned company. So you, you're an owner of the company. What do companies do when they make a profit? They share some of the profit with the owner. That's what happens. You, you're just participating in that process. That's it. There's nothing mysterious. They're not paying you every cent that they make, but they're paying you some of it. And really from, say, the IRS's perspective, what's happening is that they're charging a premium and then they see what their actual mortality expense, so how many people actually passed away that year that had policies, what was their actual investment performance, what are the actual things that actually occur in that financial year? Well, then they say, oh, okay, cool. Well, we charged more money than we strictly had to to meet our obligations. We have what's known as a divisible surplus. They made money, and they're saying, okay, we're going to give money that we made in excess of our costs to the owners. You're an owner. That's it. That's the whole thing. That's the whole thing. Okay, let's move on. Well, let's just do a little present value calculation on what you put in for a baby. $5,000 a year for 13 years. Do you know what that would be in a mutual fund? See, here's the thing. Dave has a good point on that, that if you just invested the money instead, especially if you could do it for a child in a Roth IRA so it's completely tax-free at the age of retirement, that's huge. So what I've heard a lot of parents doing is that they hire their child. They pay the child enough so that they basically could show income low enough that they're not gonna have a tax burden, and then they put that income into a Roth IRA. So if you set this up as a parent starting from the age of one, and you put $5,000 a year into it, paying the child out over the course of their lifetime, I mean, just imagine what that could be by the time they actually start working and actually start paying taxes. That's money that they could have for life. That'll set them up for the rest of their life. Not, you know, crazy enough to go and ball out of clubs every night, but enough that they'd have a secure retirement just within 10 years of doing this early on if you have the money to spare. Okay, let's talk about this Roth IRA thing. So he wants to build a comparison, Graham does here. Instead of using whole life insurance, why don't you take the $5,000 a year example that Dave has got going here? Why don't you put that money into a Roth IRA? Well, okay, a Roth IRA is a retirement account, right? It's right there in the name, <laughs> Roth Investment Retirement Account. You can't really use that until retirement, until the arbitrary age that the government has decided is retirement age, right? And the rules just changed on IRAs and the ages and, and all these things. And guess what? They're going to change again. So I don't know about you, but I like kind of having some predictability in what my financial life is going to look like. But that is missing, I'm mean, hugely missing the point. It's not a question of, will you have a bunch of money at age 65 or 67 or 72 or whatever? It's a question of, is it more valuable to you to help your child, who is, I guess in this example, one year old, is it more important to you to help them succeed right now and then help them succeed when they're 18 and when they're 22, when they're going to college or not, when they're going to trade school or not, when they're starting their first business, when they're starting to do their own investing, when they're getting married, when they're buying a car, when they're doing any of these things, the things that you do in a lifetime, that's when you need money. And the decisions you're making when you're 18, 22, 30, those are much 
bigger impact on your retirement than whether or not your parents put $5,000 a year into a Roth IRA, right? Because can you use the Roth IRA? Well, no, right? It's a retirement account. The cash value in one of these properly designed life insurance policies, I'll just say an IBC policy, is accessible by the owner at any time on a contractually guaranteed basis, period. It doesn't matter what the money is for. It doesn't matter how long you take to pay it back in. It doesn't matter. When your child is turning 18 and you'd like to do something nice for them for graduation, well, cool. If you're putting $5,000 a year in there for 18 years or 13 years or whatever time frame we pick, if you're putting all that money in there, guess what? There's a lot of cash value. Tap into that, do something, and then have a plan to get rid of that policy loan. While you're paying back the policy loan, yeah, there's an interest cost, but the cash value is continuing to increase. And you're not missing out on anything by touching it. You're getting the benefit of uninterrupted compounding, which is something that you do not get by putting it into a Roth IRA. We can talk more about that another time. It's in my book, Between the Lies by Luke Tatum. Please look it up. That's It's not the same thing at all. So you get to do that. You repay the loan. Cool. They're 22, just graduating college, let's say. Well, okay, you'd like to help them buy a, a, a good car or maybe put a down payment on a house. Well, guess what? You've already been accumulating all this money. It's been compounded. Do that. Pay off the loan. See, the difference between this and a regular mortgage, when you pay off a mortgage, you have the house, you don't have any money, right? Because you had to just drain your bank account to get rid of that mortgage note. When you pay off a policy loan, let's say you have a $50,000 policy loan out, when you pay that $50,000 off, guess how much cash value you have? $50,000 plus whatever you already had in the policy plus whatever it earned in the meantime. It's not gone. You repay it, it's all available again. It doesn't go up and down with the stock market. It's not invested in the stock market. It's just completely wrong to, to think of it that way. It's a completely different scenario. If I didn't need any money till I was 65 or 67 or whatever age, okay, fine. But uh, I don't know about you. I'm not 65 or 67 yet, and I do need money. I need to be able to access money at different times for different purposes. <laughs> and so it's kind of nice that in a whole life insurance policy, I can, I can access it. Okay, let's move on. Instead of putting it into this ripoff thing and making 4% on your money, and when he dies, he loses his cash value. If you had put this in a good mutual fund, you'd have 100x, 10x the amount of money. So just for clarification, if you do this for a child, starting at the age of zero, just until the age of 10, you invest a total of $50,000 during that time, even assuming during that first 10 years, the money's not earning anything. After 50 years, so by the time the child is 60 years old, they'd have one and a half million dollars completely tax-free just from 10 years of investing early on in a Roth IRA when they're too young to work anyway. So to me, that $50,000 is going to turn to one and a half million tax-free. <sighs> Come on, do this. If you have the money, do it. Now Graham's getting into some of the stuff that I rag on Dave Ramsey about, and this is some of what I just cannot let stand. I've frozen the, the screen here. I'm looking at right now the investment calculator that he's pulled up. He's got $50,000 starting amount over, hold on, it says 50 years? Okay, $50,000 over 50 years earning 7% return annually compounding. That is not what happens when you put money in the stock market. It's just it's just not what happens. Does the stock market have negative years? Yes, it does. Does it have negative years somewhat often? Yes, it does. Is that the same thing as uninterrupted compounding? No, it's not. What does the calculator show? It shows uninterrupted compounding. That's not what it, that's not correct. That is not how much money you would have from putting it in the stock market. It doesn't matter what the average rate of return is. If you want to get a full breakdown on this, it's in my book. The book is 99 cents on Kindle, Between the Lies by Luke Tatum. Check it out. But that's just wrong. It's just fundamentally wrong. Doesn't matter what the fund fees are. It doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. It's wrong. Let's move on. I mean, banks use this product to- No, they do money. not. 
You've yes, been watching too much TikTok. Banks do not use so. whole life. We Google it and see what typically banks do with their money. I believe typically banks uh, never put money. Let me tell you what banks do. They put it in bonds. Yeah, banks are out there doing this crap. You think banks, you think really JP Morgan's out there being like, Ooh, let's go and do the infinite banking concept. Then we'll borrow against whole life insurance policy. No, come on. They're not doing it. Putting in treasuries and bonds like Dave Ramsey said. <laughs> okay. Okay. So this idea that banks do not put money in life insurance. They're not doing infinite banking. I don't know what they call it in their board meetings. I don't think that they're probably sitting there talking about the infinite banking concept. You can go to the FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, which all banks are members. You can go to the FDIC website, FDIC.gov, and you can look up a financial statement on any branch of any bank that you want. And you know what? It's a specific line item on the financial statement. I have the exact instructions on how to do this in my book. Look at the financial statement. There is a line item for life insurance, and it's not a small number. You just do it. Just look at it. It's right there for every bank, and they have tons and tons of life insurance assets. That's just so blatantly wrong. It's so incorrect to argue with this caller and tell him that that's not true. I, that's that's just, uh, I gotta, gotta complain about that. Okay, I think one more section on the video here. Paid up yeah, additions are the only way that cash value increases unless you're using a universal life program B where you pay extra my... to get the extra insurance, which is another form yeah. of paid up additions. That isn't coming out of my pocket, though. I put 70000 It is coming out of your pocket. So it's kind of like saying I'm buying a dividend stock, and all the dividends it's giving me is free. That's free money that I can then go and buy more of the stock of to increase my returns to pay me out more dividends. I, I get that, but the money's still not free. I mean, you're investing it, so you, you have an opportunity cost there. If you had to put it somewhere else, the money would be earning more money or maybe the same somewhere else. So whatever you're getting back from that, it's not free money. No, nothing is ever free. You don't get ever something for nothing. Unless you hit the like button and subscribe. Okay, so Dave Ramsey here bringing up some you know, terminology in the life insurance world. Paid up additions. Paid up additions, you pay more than you have to pay for your life insurance, and you're, you're putting in basically an optional premium. The optional premium buys more death benefit. So one-time payment to increase the death benefit on your policy. And so Graham, to his credit, he's not wrong. There is a cost to do that. Depending on the company, you may have, say, you buy $1,000 worth of paid-up additions. You put in $1,000, in other words, and you might only have $900, $950, something in that range. It could be higher, but it may only be that right out of the gate. Okay, so you put in $1,000, you only have access to 900 950 965 who knows, something like that. It depends on the policy. Yes, opportunity cost, correct. However, <laughs> it will, on a guaranteed basis, earn you more cash value for the rest of your life or whoever the insured person in this insurance policy is. For the rest of that person's life, that will increase in value steadily. So it's only less than the starting amount for a very short duration in all likelihood. Now, Dave Ramsey here again is just incorrect in saying that the only way that the cash value increases in a whole life or IBC policy is by buying paid up additions. If you want to really get it going quickly, if you want to have a very efficient vehicle for managing your cash flows, then yes, I mean, you should be getting paid up additions, but it's not the only way the cash value increases. It's not, it's not that you have to pay these extra premiums in order for the cash value to increase. We already talked about this in this video. The cash value increases on a guaranteed basis. And even Graham pointed that out when he was looking at the Nerd Wallet article. It get, increases on a guaranteed basis. My cash value and my policies go up every single day and will continue to do so every single day for as long as I live, period. Now the dividends are on top of that. I like to have my dividends increase my cash value further by buying additional paid up additions. So yes, it's a helpful way to think of it. You own a stock, the stock pays a dividend, you use the dividend to buy more shares of the stock. But it's not a stock, it's a life insurance policy. It's this very tax protected, tax favored vehicle, and it's, it's growing. You have this asset that's growing. But again, it's going to do this no matter what. So I can do that and go buy a stock that earns a dividend if I want to. You know, Dave talks about universal life here. You know, okay, the universal life, I'm not going to touch that. I don't like universal life policies. The policy earning a dividend and increasing the cash value and all those things, like 
that doesn't require you to do anything. In fact, there are ways that you can stop paying premiums past a certain point in these whole life policies, and they'll still earn dividends, and they'll still increase in cash value every single day, regardless of what you do. So that's just wrong. It's just wrong. Um, yes, there's a cost, but there's a cost to investing too. I, I don't understand why why we're not on the same page here. It's not, it's not actually that complicated. All right, let's talk about a couple of the comments on this video. I, I promised that at the beginning. Let's talk about comments. So let's scroll down. Okay, we have this comment from Apollos5184. I always thought of infinite banking as having enough savings to bar, borrow from and then pay yourself back the money with 0% interest. I don't know where that came from, but that's just what I thought it was. We touched on this earlier in the video. It is, from a certain perspective, alluring to think of it as you are paying back with 0% interest, but that's not correct. That's, that is wrong. There is an interest rate cost to your policy loans. There's a number of reasons why this is much more favorable than a loan from a bank at the same interest rate. Look up simple interest versus an amortization schedule, say for a mortgage or what have you. The interest on a policy loan is simple interest. So if you take out $50,000, the loan balance starts at $50,000. It's not assuming a 30-year repayment with a huge, huge balance that you have to decrease over time. It just, it just starts at the amount you started with. That's it. It's very easy, very simple, very flexible. Okay, that's wrong. <laughs> it's not 0% interest. Maybe the policy pays a high dividend and it offsets your interest cost. Now, you got to think too, if you have $10,000, in the cash value in a policy and you access 2000 of it because you need to go buy a refrigerator, well, your interest rate is not 5% on the whole cash value, which is $10,000. It's 5% on $2,000. So it's pretty likely that it'll outpace the interest on your policy loan if you're only accessing 20% of it. But it depends. If you're constantly loaning out to the nth degree, well, then maybe your performance in the policy is less than your interest cost, but it's still a much, much, much more favorable environment than, say, Chase Bank, right? All right. Travel Nurses Adventures 3225 said, infinite banking smiles the Fed Reserve Bank. That is, they, this person knows what's up. Absolutely. I have a lot to say about the Fed in my book, and uh, it should be talked about, but this is not that, okay? One of the actual key strengths, one of the main reasons that I love whole life insurance and life insurance companies in general is that they aren't banks. They're not part of the fractional reserve system. They aren't governed by the Federal Reserve. They don't participate in that nonsense. They are a 100% reserve institution, if you want to think of it that way. The money is actually there. Good point. Okay, David Harvell 3191 posted, yeah, Ramsey can be too conservative with respect to using debt and credit cards and the like, but his general logic is sound. I too have tried to understand the concept of infinite banking, and I came to the same conclusion. It makes no sense. I, I have to be honest here. It is a little bit of a barrier to entry. It is confusing. One of the best ways to really understand infinite banking is to read a book. And a lot of people don't have time to do that. Thankfully, Becoming Your Own Banker by Nelson Nash is available on audiobook now. It's on Audible. You can listen to it. It's wonderful. That's a short book. Anybody can find time if they want to, to listen to that book. I recommend a paper copy because there are tables of numbers in it. But, you know, maybe that's a reinforcement to the audiobook. You have to spend a little bit of time. You have to take some responsibility for your own financial well-being and understand why so many people and banks are using this. Why do they move their money into life insurance contracts when they could just do these other things, which are obviously better? Well, there must be a reason. What is the reason? I've touched on some of those things, but you should probably want to understand it and and don't read it with you know a bad attitude don't go read becoming your own banker just far enough in to find something that you really don't like and then close the book and never look at it again that, that that's not what i'm talking about i'm talking about evaluating the material with an open mind i think it's worth it i reread becoming your own banker every year maybe you should do just say maybe there's people a lot of people asking for full video from graham on infinite banking well, if he doesn't get around to it, you could certainly stop by our channel, stick around, and you'll find lots of videos on specific details 
of the infinite banking and how you apply it to your own life. This video is more for fun, but we will have a lot of uh, nuts and bolts breaking things down here on the channel. Okay, Lonzo Bayman, Bayman, he says, infinite banking, hmm, sounds like BS. Come on, people. <laughs> Graham Stephan replied to that, said, agreed. Okay, well, infinite banking does sound kind of like a, a scam, doesn't it? It does, it really does. Infinite money, infinite wealth, you know, putting the money infinite in with a personal finance strategy, that's kind of, uh, it's not about that. It's not about that at all. Nelson named this the infinite banking concept because there are an infinite number of ways that you can use it. It's an idea. It's an exercise in imagination, right? Thinking of the ways that you could deploy this asset that you own and control no matter what, that's infinite. It's not about infinite money. So get that out of your head. It has nothing to do with that. It's increasing, but it's not infinite. Okay, last one that I want to touch on. This one actually isn't talking about the infinite banking concept at all, but this is just one of those things that, that drives me up the wall sometimes. Marty Kaufman says, yeah, that makes a lot of sense to put it in a mutual fund. So again, is the goal to just have a really large number in an account that you can't use your whole life? Or is the goal to have a place to store wealth that you can access throughout your lifetime to fund a wedding, cars, anything you want, and investments too, but anything that you need to finance, you don't have to go to the bank. You don't have to ask for money. You just have this asset. You've been building it up. It's yours. You say, I would like $25,000, please. And they say, okay, that's all it is. So you'd have to repay it. Well, even that's debatable, but that's a different video. But you do you should repay. You should have a plan to put the money back in the policy once you're taking a policy loan. But it teaches you to be diligent and 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 take care with your financial moves. You can't just uh, you can't just get something for nothing, as Graham would say. I hope this video helped, and I hope that you'll stick around, come back and see us here on the channel. I'm gonna do a whole lot of content on infinite banking. Uh, but this was a lot of fun. Hope you enjoyed it. Till next time.